Um, <clears throat> I really appreciate seeing so many different people from different backgrounds here. It's one thing that's quite fascinating about this field and, um, and certainly the attraction of blockchain and NFTs has drawn engineers and artists and curators and archivists uh, together to think about what the future could be. Eric did a great job of laying out the theoretical foundation of blockchain and its possibilities as a sort of immutable historical record where we can verify transactions and other kind of facts. And for those of us in the arts, uh, especially working in digital culture, that's really appealing idea, right? That we can, we can kind of grab stuff out of the digital ether and, and kind of solidify it in some virtual tablet that we can consult whenever we want to know whether something happened or not. Uh, I'm going to take that theory of blockchain and kind of hit it against reality um, in a test case based on one of the most prominent NFT um, sales to date, which is um, the, the sale of uh, works by Andy Warhol uh, in 2021. And we'll see how the promise of blockchain works out in that regard, because let's face it, you know, uh, the blockchain is kind of an archivist's dream, according to its enthusiasts. It's an immutable uh, public record, it's transparent, immune from censorship and, and, uh, and hacking, um, as Eric described it. Uh, who wouldn't want that kind of uh, tool at their disposal if what you're trying to do is uh, establish an art market that's verifiable as well as uh, essentially preserve art for the future. Um, so I'm going to just uh, share some slides in which I talk through some of that. And then I'm going to ask you guys, because I'm not sure how much, uh, how much understanding there is of, of NFTs, which are a particular application of blockchain, non-fungible tokens that you may have heard about, how much uh, understanding there is of that. Um, among the audience. So we'll, I'll do a short preview of what I'm gonna talk about, and then we'll do a little poll and, and see where we stand there. So I'm gonna share my screen, boom. And I do encourage people to, um, to, to ask questions during this talk. I will make several opportunities in the middle of my conversation to share those questions and, and answer them. So hopefully it's not just me talking for 40 minutes. Here we go. So you should see a picture of uh, Andy Warhol uh, and an NFT marker next to it. So it's gonna be called crypto preservation, which is the general idea of, could we use the blockchain and NFTs and cryptography in general to um, help us preserve digital works, which are notoriously ephemeral. Um, and the ghost of Andy Warhol, because Andy has been dead for quite a few decades, but his sort of aura seems to come up uh, periodically when people talk about art and Bitcoin um, applied together. So as I mentioned, um, we can think about these things uh, as, as a sort of model, uh, a, a perfect sort of archival record. Um, and in addition to the sort of advantages that Eric mentioned, we have things like um, platforms are built upon the blockchain that offer more service, more value besides just this kind of record of transactions. So for example, you have JPG or jury protocol galleries is uh, potentially enabling bots to sort of compute the provenance of digital artworks and their appearance in exhibitions or publications. You can kind of correlate all that info. We've got distributed file systems. Uh, Eric mentioned peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, this is a model for storing digital assets that aren't just uh, subject to one server somewhere that could go down, but are in fact distributed across multiple systems. And the most prominent one of those right now is called IPFS, or the rather uh, highfalutin name, Interplanetary File System. And then you've got uh, projects like Arweave that propose a dedicated cryptocurrency, kind of like Bitcoin. Um, as a financial incentive to support the cost of governing and sustaining this sort of permanent web or perma web. So all this sounds great, but as dreamy as this picture sounds, we can separate the hype from the reality by examining real life case. Again, I'm gonna look at the 2021 auction of Andy Warhol's digital art as NFTs. The goal is to see how much of this promise is overblown and what can actually approve 
the access and preservation of digital heritage. So in 1985, uh, Andy Warhol, one of the best known pop artists uh, of all time, uh, and probably one of the best known artists in history, uh, was given an opportunity to make digital artwork. And this was not really a part of, a, of, of the historical um, awareness of most art historians um, until 2014, when um, works that he created uh, during an unveiling of a new computer, the 1985 Amiga, uh, were discovered um, thanks to some forensic work by a group at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, led by Golan Levin, um, as well as a number of graduate students and the artist Corey Archangel, went back and forensically discovered these original works. So this gave digital art the sort of imprimatur of an art world celebrity. In 2014, suddenly we realized, wow, one of the most well-known artists of history actually experimented with digital work. Now, the only reason people know about this is that the conservators of those images translated the idiosyncratic pro-paint vintage format, this weird 1985 Amiga image format that had not existed before, because the whole point was to show, wow, this is a personal computer that you can use to make images. So it was uh, a software that hadn't even been released to the public. So uh, Golan Levin and, uh, and his collaborators translated this idiosyncratic format into upscale JPEGs, the kind of you know, images that we know and love from the internet now. And then the Warhol Foundation posted those online to let the public know about this amazing discovery. Six years later, at one of the first peaks of the craze over NFTs or non-fungible tokens, the owners authorized Christie's to sell the migrated files via unique crypto tokens. So without getting into too much detail, suffice to say that the same way that the blockchain enables verification of a transaction, it also enables uh, artists to sell uh, a, a reference to a digital work by uh, recording that to the blockchain. And this is what this non-fungible token or NFT means. The reason it's non-fungible is that Bitcoins, for example, are all equal. Like if I have one Bitcoin, you have one Bitcoin, they're the same value. But if two of us, uh, but, but every one of these, uh, so those are fungible, interchangeable. But each of the transactions that is, uh, becomes a record of an artwork in the NFT world is non-fungible in the sense that uh, essentially once I sell this record once, I can't sell it again. Uh, so unlike Bitcoins, they are not equivalent and each one is unique. And so the whole premise here is that we're trying to take something that is infinitely duplicable, like a JPEG of a monkey, and instead make it unique so that when I buy it, I know I've somehow bought this unique item. So during the peaks of this NFT craze, the owners, namely the Warhol Foundation, authorized Christie's to sell these migrated files via these crypto tokens or NFTs. Now, they weren't the same files as the original. They actually referred to the upscale JPEGs that uh, the Carnegie Mellon team had created. But nevertheless, uh, NFTs for these sort of improved images fetched $3 million at auction. And you know, when you look at what um, people said at the time, you see the uh, Christie CEO, bragging that the sale represented the possibility of securing the uniqueness and authenticity of this work on the blockchain. So again, the very kinds of promise that Erke mentioned in his talk. And a, representation of the, a representative of the World Foundation said, this is a watership, uh, watershed moment in the history of digital art. And he didn't mean the idea that Warhol made digital work. That had been known since 2014. He meant that you could actually sell it. So these claims of securing authenticity are the kinds of things that you hear people say when they talk about how great NFTs are going to be for museums and art history. We're going to look at these claims and kind of pick them apart. But before we do, I want to get a sense of how the audience um, sort of um, how much awareness of NFTs and, and of maybe um, how they relate to selling and, and preserving art, uh, the, the sort of um, 
the audience has. So uh, what I'd like to do is then launch a poll for you guys to participate in that um, will give us a sense of where we stand in terms of this knowledge. Uh, there's a lot of myths about um, NFTs, and there are some things that are, you know, commonly brewed about it that I think are true about them. And I'd like to gauge that. Um, so, Osman, if it's possible to launch the poll now, that would be great. Okay. Um, now launch uh, the poll. Yeah. Okay, so you should see a little screen pop up in your Zoom window, and um, it's very simple. And there's, it's not like, <laughs> you know, don't worry, you're not going to be graded on this. Um, it's just a, a quick sense of, of what you think most of these statements are on the balance true or on the balance false. And um, again, uh, Osman, I'm going to rely on you to. Uh, sort of um, figure uh, out when we've got a quorum and how to represent that to the rest of us. Uh, participants uh, now see uh, the poll. And we can wait. So again, don't worry. Um, you can just uh, use your you know, intuition or um, immediate subjective response. Uh, there's no, um, there's no immediate uh, requirement. <laughs> We're going to go over each of these individually, and and there are also disagreements about uh, whether the statements are true or false. So I'm just curious what the opinions are of people in the room. Um, Submit mutton not working says one of the attendees. So I'm not sure if that's a problem for everyone. While you're uh, hopefully uh, working on that. Now, 70% uh, uh, answered. We can wait uh, for 30 seconds, I know. So, so you are getting some responses there? Yeah. OK, good. In the meantime, while you guys are filling that out, um, someone asked, how can I protect antiquities with NFTs in the most effective way without a profit motive? We have artists and poets whose relative to my family and copyrighted, including unpublished ones. We want to protect these works as NFTs. Should I digitize the artworks? Um, no. I'm going to give you a short answer, no. Uh, but um, I will give you a, uh, a more specific uh, reason as we move on. Uh, I know there were cases in which, uh, there's a high profile case in which someone I believe created an NFT from a script or book. I'm trying to remember what it was. It was a screenplay for a movie um, and ended up paying a lot of money for something that did not in fact guarantee the copyright of the work at all. And we'll, we'll, we'll show how that applies to the Warhol example soon. Um, yeah, John, uh, I'm finishing the poll now. Okay, great. And if you wanna share the results, um, Osman, I'll be okay. interested to see it. Yeah, you uh, can you see uh, now uh, pulse with pulse section? I don't see it myself. Oh, there we go. All right. Okay, so I'm assuming everyone can see this poll that um, we put out here. NFTs require bit currencies, um, or cryptocurrencies. Uh, most people said true. Some artists have made millions with NFTs. Almost everybody said true. That's a headline that I'm sure all these people have read. Um, $69 million is the figure quoted frequently for the sale of every days by people. NFTs are a way to sell digital images. 82% true. NFTs transfer copyright. Hmm, interesting. 61% said false. And that we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, NFTs democratize the art world. Pretty even split there. <laughs> Interesting, with a slight of advantage to the true people. Making NFTs is expensive. 80% um, said false. Interesting. Um, digital art has finally been recognized thanks to NFTs. Another split answer. And NFTs preserve art for posterity. 55% true. So let's examine each of these individually. Um, I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. 
uh, which you should now see each of these kind of topics one at a time. Okay. And again, this represents my subjective, well, I'm going to tell you my subjective answer for each of these. And, um, and, and then you can, you know, we can disagree about them, or you can look up other, uh, other people with different opinions, but I'll give you mine. NFTs require grip, grip, uh, cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I don't know of a single example of an NFT that doesn't. They're not all dependent on Bitcoin. There are a number of other uh, cryptocurrencies out there. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Tezos being one and, and Ether, Ether, Ethereum being the most common. Um, but, uh, but there are quite a few different cryptocurrencies attached to NFTs, but they all require one. I can't think of one that doesn't. It's kind of part of the definition of an NFT. Some artists have made millions with NFTs. That's true. And those headlines you saw about uh, the $69 million Christie sale are, are not apocryphal, except with a caveat. And the caveat here is that the sales are typically not in dollars or uh, national currency. They're in cryptocurrencies. And that makes a big difference because someone like Medicoven, the buyer of the famous $69 million people sale, was an early investor in cryptocurrency. So he bought, you know, Bitcoin when it was like, um, you know, $30. He had an amassed of, of a fortune of, uh, of Ethereum, which is what the, the Beeple sale was at, um, well in advance of it becoming expensive. And in fact, during, or if you look at the price of Ethereum before and after the famous uh, Christie sale of Beeple, that value of Ethereum doubled after the sale. So if you imagine that he had, you know, um, a certain, let's say a thousand ether in his possession, in his, in his wallet, and he spent, you know, half of that, 500 on Beeple, then afterward, the value he had left, the 500, was worth a thousand again. So it's really misleading to say that he spent um, $69 million on a Beeple. Uh, in essence, he made money by buying the Beeple. And that's before he even, even resold it. And there's other factors in there that really make us sort of question these headlines. Yes, I think we, we can say it's true that artists have made millions. But have they made, made millions in dollars? Well, that's a little, that's a little, uh, uh, there's a little gray area there, let's just say. And the economics is not as clear as it might seem. But sure, there are artists definitely making money with uh, NFTs. Making an NFT is always expensive? No, actually. Um, there are NFTs that are very pricey. If you want to put something on an Ethereum blockchain right now, it's going to cost you several hundred dollars uh, just in gas fees because so many people want to use that particular blockchain and it uses proof of work, which as Erky said, is very computationally expensive. And so those fees of all the computer cycles get passed down to you as the artist. So you're not going to be able to just throw something up there for $50. You're going to be outlaying a bunch of money to, to put something on Ethereum. However, there are other chains, as I mentioned, and Tezos, for example, is a proof of stake chain where you can mint something for $10. Um, it's a, um, and minting is the process of creating an NFT and offering it for sale. So um, it is not true that NFTs have to be expensive uh, to make. Do they democratize the art world? I'm going to give a big no on this one. I know that that was something that people felt that that was a possibility. I think it democratizes in the sense that more people are involved and more people, if they can figure out how a crypto wallet works, uh, can actually buy NFTs. So in some sense, it, it democratizes the, uh, the process of collecting art, but it is not in any way, uh, according to studies, democratizing who gets the money for sales of art. Um, the Nature did a study, uh, and there have been numerous others from CryptoArt.io showing that you know 1% of NFT creators get 90% of the revenue. So if you look at that curve, it's a power law, just like the curve of the, of the old art world we're trying to get rid of with its, its own inequities. The, the, so far, the NFT world is mirroring that same uh, social and uh, kind of uh, economic inequalities. Uh, there's, there's other issues to talk about there, but that's my take on it. NFTs are a way to sell digital images. No, they're not. Okay, so in, with rare exceptions, when you buy an NFT, you are not buying an image. 
you're not actually buying the rights to a digital asset. You are merely uh, um, adding a transaction to a blockchain that is in essence saying, yes, you have paid for this pointer to a digital image. And this is by far the biggest misunderstanding of NFTs. When you buy an NFT, you are buying a token, a record, a pointer to a, an image. And you can say, well, the pointer or the record is the artwork, or you can say that the image is the artwork, but most people sort of assume that somehow you have inherently bought the image. And that's just not the case. And we'll talk about how that applies in the specific case of Warhol, but it's pervasive across almost all uh, NFT sales with the exception of uh, on-chain uh, code. NFTs transfer copyright? No. In almost no case do you get copyright exclusive or non-exclusive to the original image. In fact, what you're getting is simply, uh, an, again, a sort of token that says, I have paid for this pointer to, uh, to the image itself. And there are some cases in which uh, copyright is transferred, but those are uh, few and far between and they're negotiated by platforms, not by the blockchain itself. Digital art has arrived due to NFTs. Thank you, finally, all of us making digital art can say yes, uh, museums will now pay attention to us because uh, you know, NFTs have brought that financial uh, spotlight onto our work. No, uh, digital art arrived quite a long time ago and it's been in museum collections since the 90s and even earlier. Um, at the Guggenheim, I was a curator involved in net art commissions around 2000 um, and, and, and many other uh, curators have works in their collection that are digital and um, they've been bought and sold before NFTs existed. NFTs preserve digital art for posterity. I'm gonna give that a big no. I'm going to talk about why during the pay, the exact um, sort of the rest of my talk. Okay, so I just wanted to get some of those things out of the way um, as a kind of um, uh, a pre pre preview or, or sort of like uh, talking about the, the world of NFTs and what we've heard and what might and might not be true. Again, these are my opinions, but I'm happy to, to kind of um, discuss them as we go on. In the meantime, there are half, have to been um, some people who said yes conditional answers yeah i wanted to kind of not let people make conditional like maybe <laughs> i wanted to make people take a stand and true or false but of course this is just a kind of straw poll um solana someone mentions that's another uh, example of a, a blockchain that uh, has uh, doesn't have the fees uh, the same structure that uh, ethereum does um, Luis uh, mentioned in the near future, can we see the acquisition of NFTs from private collections to public collections, such as museums or digital museums, or will they never leave the digital metaverse private space? No, there are already museums uh, that have collected NFTs and Daniel will talk about an example of that later today. Um, Marin mentioned um, uh, the cost of creating NFT on Ethereum, uh, figure mentions out $100. Um, gas fee was 0.01 ethereum 20 to 24 dollars i've never heard of someone uh making an nft that cheap on ethereum that's good for you marin um i'm assuming that did not include the costs of buying getting a wallet and transferring currency and that sort of thing uh but uh but that's good to know thank you for telling me that uh my data may be a little out of date um so Let's go on um, and, and talk about the, um, the sort of some of these limits in more detail. And I'm going to focus specifically on one case study, and it may not be true of every other case study, but uh, one of the things that we talked about is that copyright is not typically transferred when you buy an NFT. So um, it's important to remember what you're buying when you buy an NFT. So unlike unique originals, collecting a non-fungible token doesn't convey the rights to the image, the status of that image is, is the same in almost every case. Um, so the relationship, well, let's let's show what that looks like. So, and a blockchain is kind of like a big calculator or receipt in the sky. Everybody can see it, no one can change it. Um, then on the blockchain, there is a pointer to the image. Um, and this is what the NFT is, is essentially that pointer that through a separate intermediary uh, called a metadata file has a link to the image that's sitting on a server or somewhere. Or in the better case scenario, um, instead of one server that can go down, it lives on a peer-to-peer -peer network. 
um, something like IPFS, in which case there are multiple computers hosting that image. And in the case of these, um, these, uh, uh, the, the, in, in the case of NFTs, um, you might think, well, well, uh, I'm, I'm assuming then there, there, there is a, a copyright um, uh, provision where that's transferred to me as soon as I record my transaction on the on the big receipt in the sky. But that's not true. Um, you, you're actually uh, buying this kind of block on the chain. And then there is this, um, uh, after that, there is this metadata file that that points to from the blockchain. And then the metadata file itself then points to the image on a server. So this is kind of like this long, thin, sort of shaky wire between the thing you buy and the thing that is represented by it. Legally speaking, um, there is no statutory or case law to support owning the copyright of an image just because you bought the, the token for it. So that makes NFTs kind of in a strange situation. Um, if you look at the conditions of sale of Christie's sale of those Warhols for $3 million, you notice that it says um, your rights, you know, you, uh, your purchase of the lot, which is the NFT, does not provide any rights, express or implied, in copyright and so on, the digital asset. So it explicitly disavows any rights to the image. It also says, um, you know, you have the ability to sort of show it uh, for your own purpose, but that's it. Um, and um, that means that your NFT is not really, you know, the image. It's this kind of people sometimes refer to as bragging rights or a token or a record or a pointer to the image. So legally speaking, you know, just because you own a mug for the, you know, uh, Los Angeles Lakers, you know, kind of team doesn't mean you own a brand basketball franchise. It's, it's more like this kind of collectible that goes along with the other item, but it's not the other item. That's why, um, you know, John Cleese, the comedian could sell uh, an NFT of the Brooklyn Bridge. He doesn't own the Brooklyn Bridge, but he can sell it because he doesn't have to convey the rights to it. There are some platforms that, um, that bundle rights with an NFT. Um, that's a kind of a mess of its own, but generally speaking, NFTs do not convey rights to the image. So you're not really buying that image. Uh, you're not owning the asset. It's like, uh, it's like pure ownership of something without any rights or responsibilities that go with it. Uh, which is a really odd idea if you're not used to this uh, NFTs. So that's the first issue with thinking about a, a blockchain as a preservation medium for digital art is that ownership is not conveyed. Second issue is that storage is not preservation, right? So I admit that blockchain is a secure storage medium. I think it's very secure. I think it's almost tamper proof, um, but that doesn't mean that it's, um, it's, it's gonna preserve art for the future. Um, we know that servers go down. We know that there are problems. Uh, MySpace in 2019 lost 50 million songs, right? Even though it's potentially a cloud provider, server migration, they botched that. Now, fortunately, most of the legitimate assets, uh, or I should say the, the more uh, dedicated and diligent uh, platforms that sell NFTs use something like interplanetary file network, which as I mentioned is a peer-to-peer -peer network. So in that case, you don't have to worry so much about one you know, server going down or one botch migration. You have it spread across multiple nodes. And that's a great idea. But the problem is these kind of systems are less likely to suffer from a sudden you know, destruction like those you know, 50 million songs on MySpace. They're more likely to suffer from a gradual degradation as peers abandon the system, um, you know, Napster and Nutella were well known at their time as file sharing systems. How many people still operate those nodes? Um, Nifty Gateway sold a bunch of NFTs by high profile artists, including Grimes. And, uh, you know, a week later, they still hadn't pinned them to the nodes, which means they hadn't properly distributed them through the system. So unfortunately, um, that's a kind of vulnerability uh, point. And if you look at the, if you look at again at the conditions of sale uh, in the fine print of Christie's contract for Warhol, you see a laundry list of possible problems that they are indemnifying themselves for. So they're saying like, well, we're not going to be responsible for this, and we're not going to be responsible for that. Everything from you know 
51% uh, in Sybil attacks, which are particular to certain kinds of blockchains, to forgotten passwords and mistyped addresses. That's already been a problem. I think Daniel I mentioned that as well. And uh, as well as uh, unfavorable regulatory determinations. <laughs> um, so, you know, when I see this, I, it reminds me of those drug ads you see on TV where they say they show all these happy people, but then they give you all the list of side effects that could happen if you take this drug. You know, uh, vomiting, nausea, heart attack, death. This is pretty scary stuff. Um, so, so Christie's lawyers are saying, like, look, we're not going to guarantee that you're always going to have access to this. Um, notwithstanding even the legal side, just even the 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 that the blockchain is going to function properly. But even if we did, even if blockchain you know persists forever, and all those bits are up there and they're immutable, and we don't have to worry because they've all been saved. And all the nodes persist on IPFS, or everybody moves uh, all the you know code for these artworks directly on chain, so we all have access to it forever. There's still a problem. The problem is that storage is not preservation, and I like to call this the linear A problem. So I'm sure uh, many of the the Turkish folks and Mediterranean people in the audience uh, have heard of of the Minoan cultures of Crete and possibly of their linear A alphabet, which you see here on the left. Uh, this is a Phaistos disk, a sort of fired clay, kind of round thingy um, that was produced, uh, a, it's about BC 1500, I think. And, and these, um, these objects are well known because we can make out all of the characters really easily. Right? There's been no degradation uh, of the actual data. We can see the alphabet, we can see the words, we can see what order they're in. We don't have any idea what they mean. You know, some people speculate, well, this could be a king or this could be a you know crop or whatever. But it's it's without the context, without the cultural context, linear A is an, an alphabet we just can't read. There's no way for us to understand it. So you might say, well, what does that have to do with digital work? Well, it means that if the context doesn't survive, you can't understand the program or the image, even if you preserve the ones and zeros. And the problem is compounded for future historians by the fact that digital ones and zeros have all these layers of hardware and software required to decode them. You've got, you know, maybe the uh, a code that makes it generates an image, but that takes place inside a browser that requires JavaScript and HTML and CSS, and that in turn requires an operating system, and that in turn requires a certain kind of computer and even kind of voltage. So all of these onion layers have to work perfectly for the thing to be preserved. And, and yeah, so you can see with the case of linear A, that hasn't happened and it's much less likely to happen for digital art. So as an example, imagine that the technology for you know, minting NFTs on the blockchain come out five or 10 years ago. Well, a lot of these little animations that you see in the NFT space would probably have been produced with Flash, right? Adobe Flash uh, was a, technology common for animation and visual design, graphics um, that died. And it died recently due to obsolescence about, due to concerns for its security and memory usage. So you can't run Flash anymore. You probably have seen these little pop-ups on your computer saying like, sorry, you know, Flash is deprecated and won't run anymore. Um, and it's been superseded by other languages, which is great, HTML5, but even if the blockchain perfectly preserved all the works from, you know, whatever, 2010 that were built in Flash, you couldn't run any of them now. That's the problem with these systems. Uh, one of the biggest problems, the idea that storage is preservation. It's not enough because even if Arweave or IPFS or, you know, Ethereum had saved the code, we wouldn't be able to run that regardless of whether the bits were immutable. Now, fortunately, Enterprising preservationists have other strategies. They've got other ways they can think about preserving work. Right? So migration is a very common thing where we, we change things. We move something from say Flash to HTML5 or from, you know, I don't know, Betamax to, to Digibeta to MPEG4 to VC1. We, we have all these kind of codecs and different formats that we move things through. That can have its own problems. So in the case of the Warhols, there was a very particular failure of migration. Um, which always migration from one platform to another, from one uh, format to another, always entails sacrificing something about the look and feel of the original work. And in art, that can be really uh, disastrous at times. So in Warhol's case, he saved these brightly colored sketches on this Amiga in 1985, and he saved them onto a floppy disk. 
these formats, these images were in this weird Amiga ProPaint format. They were 320 by 200 pixels. That's tiny now. Um, that'd be like a postage stamp on one of our you know, big 2K monitors. And we also were non-square pixels. So there was a lot of weird stuff about this image format because there were no JPEGs. There was no common uh, you know, uh, graphic interchange format yet. So that was what made these pictures important, that they're historically one of the first of their kind. And, and certainly the fact that a major artist worked with that made them doubly important. They're kind of a primitive you know, ancestor to today's robust digital graphics. And again, uh, Golan Levin and his collaborators upscaled them to 4,500 by 6,000 you know, pixels, just this huge, you know, orders of magnitude larger and save them as TIFFs, which are kind of like J a fancy version of JPEGs. Um, never suspecting that the foundation would then turn around and offer those as the associated uh, media file for sale. So when Christie's did its auction, they didn't use the originals because no one could read them. They'd use these like fancy uh, kind of JPEG versions that were really a distortion of the original item and didn't include, didn't, didn't really preserve the value of the original item. So um, that's kind of like imagining that you take a daguerreotype, right? Uh, these, you know, first generation photographs on glass and you make it into a giant, you know, wall sized glissé print or something and say like, hey, there, I improved it. No, what's interesting about the daguerreotype is its historical accuracy that, well, wow, cool. Look, here's this one of the very first photographs that people ever made. And the same thing with the, the Christie sale of the Warhols. The works that were associated via metadata were not those original images. It, it, it's like throwing away the daguerreotypes and using this newer version instead. Now, I don't want to say that, you know, uh, artists should never deviate from the original. Artists may feel that it's very important to uh, transfer their work or, or for the work to mutate over time. Um, and those deviations may be acceptable for future viewings or, or, or for, for, you know, storage uh, uh, when the original becomes obsolete. Or an artist, instead of migration, may prefer emulation, which has its own buttons you have to adjust, like the pacing and image interpolation. Other people might require reinterpretation, which is when a work is recreated each time, like the artist Def Beef does uh, with his work uh, on the blockchain. The point is that there's no way to know which of these preservation strategies uh, will work without more detailed information from the artists and other experts. So, Fortunately, the art world has a history of working with this problem of works that change over time or are ephemeral. Certificates of authenticity are a time-honored way to sell works that aren't going to stick around if you put them in a crate. Um, collectors like uh, Count Giuseppe Panza di Bumo in the 60s would buy a Lewitt wall drawing and then instead of getting you know a wall which can be painted over you get this certificate on the left uh, signed by the artist that says hey here's how to make the work and i give you ownership of it so these are still used to this day both to represent performances and ephemeral works but also increasingly electronic and media-based works which are ephemeral you're not going to as a museum store you know uh, uh tvs in a in a vault, uh, if you can buy them more more current TVs that are also acceptable, you know, just whenever you need to install the work or rent them, that kind of thing. So these certificates are very common now. Um, they're different though. They're different from NFTs in a couple of ways. One is that um, they do convey the legal rights to the work. That's the whole point of them. Um, and the second is that they often include diagrams or instructions that are necessary for recreating it. Um, again, something you don't get with NFTs. So for a, a wall drawing like follow it, it might say something like 10,000 lines about five inches long. That's literally instruction about how to draw this thing on the wall. For a video artist like Bill Viola, he like has incredible numbers of like diagrams and things and specifies everything down to the millimeter for his video installations. But however that gets to you, it's ultimately a, a, you know like a piece of paper or a digital document that's signed. The point is that if, you put a computer and a monitor in a crate and pull them out 40 years ago, they're probably not gonna work. 
But if you get guidelines from the artists and you know, authority to recreate them in new media, then those that artwork can outlive its original wires and plastic. So to help with this, um, in 1998, the Guggenheim started a project called the Variable Media Initiative. And its most prominent uh, instrument is this Variable Media Questionnaire that asks creators to choose the most appropriate strategy for dealing with the slippage that's going to happen when you have to move to new media. Um, and almost every museum now has some kind of questionnaire that they give artists when they collect a work in ephemeral media, especially you know electronic ones. You don't get any of that with a typical NFT. To date, most crypto marketplaces, you know, blithely ignore the lessons and the history of, of digital preservation. Um, there are exceptions. So, for example, um, uh, the, the um, the Guggenheim uh, uh, commissioned uh, a series of works um, around 2000, including works by Mark Shredder, Mark Napier. This is his work Shredder, which takes websites and sort of turns them inside out and shows the code that you would normally see. And in conversations with Mark, we said, hey, what do you do when you need to, you know, when the original code becomes obsolete? And he said, well, I'm not that attached to the code. You can actually rewrite it in another medium. And that's exactly what the Guggenheim did a couple of years ago when that piece became obsolete. This is pre-NFTs. However, um, the conservator uh, Regina Harsani, uh, working with Diego Mayado, um, recently attacked a similar work, uh, ironically called Shred, um, by the artist Daniel Conniger. Um, and this actually is an NFT. In fact, what it does is it pulls the most recent NFTs uh, posted to Foundation, which is like OpenSea, another NFT marketplace, and it sort of interweaves them in almost a literal way to create this, this very dynamic uh, kind of video uh, on a screen. And uh, Harrison and Moyado worked to create a very clear set of guidelines for how to preserve this work in the future. It's not on the blockchain. It's far too big. Blockchains typically can only save a very small amount of data, but, it, but it's the kind of thing that you need to preserve art. Blockchain alone is not enough. Um, some people ask, you know, well, maybe NFTs, because they're so business oriented and about making money, maybe that's really kind of preserving the spirit of, of Warhol's digital work. Um, because Warhol was famously the sort of businessman artist. Um, and he, you know, it, it, he sort of democratized the art world and that he, he wasn't doing highfalutin, you know, pictures of kings, but he was doing like Brillo boxes and Campbell soup cans. Um, he, he argued that business was sort of like an art form. And he also kind of pushed himself, displaced himself from his own work the way that NFTs do. He had, he had these piss paintings that he'd literally urinate on copper and create images from them. And he'd have other people come in and urinate. So people, some people have argued, well, you know, Warhol actually would love NFTs because it was all about like, you know, becoming more of a business and displacing the artist's hand from the work. But I think that's really misleading. And it's misleading for a couple of reasons. One is that, um, well, the, the ultimate reason being that, that Warhol was always about pushing art as far as he could into business, but only so far. He wouldn't go all the way. In fact, he was approached by people wanting him to create a, a brand of bed linens and whatever, you know, Andy Warhol's uh, pillowcases. And he said, no, I'm not doing that. that. That's not what I'm interested in. He was interested in pushing art as far as he could while still keeping it uh, connected to the artist. And uh, that's why he went through the trouble of signing those, those digital files that are, were created on that Amiga. I mean, imagine being like, it's hard enough for me now to sign one of those, you know, bank account teller things. Imagine what it'd be like to be the first person, one of the first people ever to sign your name with a mouse. I mean, you're like, wow, what's this? You know, how do I, how do I use this thing? But Warhol insisted on doing that. And he signed, signed a number of his, um, his, his images with his name, regardless of how difficult that was. NFT world is, is quite different. I mean, right now on the left, I, I have a picture from Fiverr. That's a common uh, freelance site. And if I search for like NFT, like who would make me an NFT? And the artists who came out to say, yes, I will make you something that then you can sell as your own NFT were 18,000 different offers ranging from like 10 or $20 up. So, you know, that's not digital democracy. That's a digital underclass of people who are just working to shore up cryptocurrency speculation. 
Um, we, we, we know that there are other problems with NFTs. We know that the, the, uh, you know, the, the, the energy usage of Bitcoin right now is equivalent to the Netherlands. Um, we, 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 we need to keep looking for more options to find better ways to, um, to preserve what's out there. Learning from the things that we've managed to uncover with all this excitement around blockchain and NFTs, but also not settling for just something that ultimately becomes, uh, you know, a, an, a, 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 a hitching our wagon to a horse that's really driven by, you know, commercialism and, and currency speculation rather than really do regard for what the future of, of, of art and culture could be. Because, you know, I, my concern is that, you know, yes, it's extra work uh, to come up with these artist guidelines and think about how to preserve uh, complex software at works. Um, if you're going to interview the artists, you know, that takes time and care. And those are two qualities that today's fast paced, you know, pump and dump NFT culture don't value. Um, but the advantage is that if we do that, then we'll have works that are preserved in the long run for the appreciation of artists and collectors in the late public. Meanwhile, in the absence of more thought about how to preserve stuff, huge swaths of digital art that's now being sold as, you know, via NFTs are not going to survive. They're going to fall prey to abandoned servers or hardware off or software obsolescence. Um, even those lucky enough to survive may run the risk of mistranslation into inappropriate mediums, as happened with the Warhols. So I think this bleak future awaits NFTs, even if the blockchain lives on forever. It doesn't matter if it's immutable. It's just going to end up being a virtual cemetery with digital tombstones that point to art that died because its owner trusted in automated immutability instead of deliberate care. Thank you.